We're going to start right away, my baby boys. The ship sailed on out of the ocean stream, riding a long swell on the open sea for the island of Aia. Aia. Summering dawn has dancing grounds there, and the sun has rising. But still by night, we beached on a sand shelf and waded in beyond the line of breakers to fall asleep, awaiting the day's star. When the young dawn, with her fingertips of rose, made heaven bright, I sent shipmates to bring Elpin Elpinor's body from the house of Kirk. We others cut down timber on the foreland, on a high point, and built his pyre of logs. Then stood by weeping while the flame burnt through corpse, it, through course and equipment. Then we heaped his borrow, lifting a gravestone on the mound, and fixed his light but unwarped ore against the sky. These were our rites in memory of him. Soon then, knowing us back from the dark land, Kirk came freshly adorned for us, with handmaids bearing loaves, roast meats, and ruby-colored wine. So what's going on here? Uh, they return to Kirk's Island, and they give a funeral service to the one guy. It's uh, Elpinor. They give him a funeral service just as he asks, uh, asked in the, uh, the land of the dead uh, from before. And then Kirk comes in. She's with a big feast. And she's going to feed them, obviously. That's what you do with feasts. <laughs> she stood among us in immortal beauty, jesting. Hearts of Oak, did you go down alive into the homes of death? One visit finishes all men but yourselves, twice mortal. Come, here is meat and wine. Enjoy your feasting for one whole day. And in the dawn tomorrow, you shall put out to sea. Sailing directions, landmarks, perils, I shall sketch for you. To keep you from being caught by land or water in some black sea of trouble. Black sack of trouble. And high humor and ready for a carousal, we agreed. So all that day, until the sun went down, we feasted on roast meat and good red wine, till after sunset. At the fall of night, the men dropped off to sleep by the stern hawsers. She took my hand then, silent in that hush, drew me apart, made me sit down, and lay beside me, softly questioning, as I told all I had seen, from first to last. Then said the Lady Kirk, So, all those trials are over. Listen with care to this now, and a god will arm your mind. Square in your ship's path are serenies, crying beauty to which men coasting by. Woe to the innocent who hears that sound. He will not see his lady nor his children in joy, crowding about him, home from sea. The serenies will sing his mind away on their sweet meadow lolling. There are bones of dead men rotting in a pile beside them, and flayed skins shrivel about around the spot. Oof. Steer wide, keep well to seaward, plug your oarsmen ears with beers of wax, kneaded soft. None of the rest should hear that song. But if you wish to listen, let the men untie let the men tie you in the lugger, hand and foot, back to the mast, lashed to the mast. So you may hear those harpies' thrilling voices, shout as you will, begging to be untied. Your crew must only twist one, one, twist more line around you and keep their stroke up until the singers fade. What then? One of two courses you may take, and you yourself must weigh them. I shall not plan the whole action for you now, but only tell you both. Ahead are beetling rocks and dark blue glancing amphitrite, surging, roars around them. Prowling rocks, or drifters, the gods in bliss have named them. Name them well. Not even birds can pass by them. Not even the timorous doves that bear ambrosia to Father Zeus, caught by downdrafts. They die in rock walls smooth as ice. Each time, the father wafts a new courier to make up his crew. Still less ships can get sea room of these drifters, whose boiling surf under high fe fiery winds carries the tossing wreckage of ships and men. Only one ocean-going craft, the far-famed Argo, made it, sailing from Aita. But she, too, would have crashed on the big rots of Hera, had it not been for through for love of Aison, her captain. A second course lies between headlands. One is a sharp mountain, piercing the sky, with storm cloud round the peak, dissolving never, not in the brightest summer, to show heaven's azure there, nor in the fall. No mortal man could scale it, nor so much as land there. Not with twenty hands and feet, so sheer the cliffs are, as of polished stone. Midway that height, a cavern full of mist opens toward Erebos, and evening, skirting this in the lugger. Great Odysseus, your master bowman, shooting from the deck, would come short of the cave mouth with his shaft. But that is the den of Skyla, where she yaps abomin abominably. 
abominably. A newborn whelps cry, though she is huge and monstrous. God or man, no one could look at on her and joy. Her legs, and there are twelve, are like great tentacles, unjointed. And upon her serpent necks are six born are born six heads, like nightmares of ferocity, with triple serried rows of fangs and deep gullets of black death. Half her length, she sways her heads in air, outside her horrid cleft, hunting the sea around that promontory for dolphins, dogfish, or what bigger game thundering Amphitrites, sorry, Amphitrite feeds in thousands, and no ship's company can claim to have passed her without loss and grief. She takes from every ship one man for every gullet. Ugh. Okay, um, I'm going to say Kirk, by the way. I know it's Cersei, but I just, I'm very obscure ritual, so I'd recommend you go on Spark Notes, book 12, because they probably have an easier way to explain it than whatever god-awful way I'd explain it as. Um, can we... Can we get to a summary? Where's the summary? This is not the Odyssey. A book. <laughs> I just looked at book 12 without looking up Odyssey. All right. Books 12 to 14. Okay, what happens? Cersei plugs his men's ears with big wax and has them bind him to the mast of his ship. He alone hears the song flowing forth from the island, promising to reveal the future. The siren's song is so seductive that Odysseus begs to be released from his fetters, but his faithful men only bind him tighter. Once they have passed the siren's island, Odysseus and his men must navigate the straits between Skyla, or Skyla and Chiribitis. Skyla is a six-headed monster, who, when she passes, swallows one sailor for each head. Char Charbidus is an enormous whirlpool that threatens to swallow the entire ship. As instructed by Cersei, Odysseus holds his cart course tight against the cliffs of Skyla's la la lair. All right, so basically, that's what I said. <laughs> so there's a big six-headed monster, Skyla, and they have to go between that and Chiribidus. And there's just, like, two big guys, and they want to kill them. <laughs> Sir Advice ran, but I faced your saying. Only instruct me, goddess, if you will. How, if possible, can I pass by Caribdis? Or fight off Skyla when she raids my crew? Swiftly, that lovely goddess answered me. Must you have battle in your heart forever? The bloody toil of combat? Old contender, will you not yield to the immortal gods? That nightmare cannot die, being eternal it's evil itself. Horror and pain and chaos. There's no fighting her. No power can fight her. All that avails is flight. Lose headway there, along the rock face while you break out arms, and she'll swoop over you. I fear once more, taking one man against for every again for every gullet. No, no, put all your backs into it. Row on, invoke blind force that bore this scourge of men to keep her from a second strike against you. Then you will coast to Thernachia, the island where Helios cattle graze. Fine herds, the flocks of godly sheep. The herds and flocks are seven, with fifty beasts in each. No lambs are dropped or calves, and these fat cattle never die. Immortal, too, their co-herds are. Their shepherds, Phaethusa and Lampedia, sweetly braided nymphs that divine. Nerea bore to the overlord of high noon, Helios. These nymphs, their gentle mother, bred and placed upon three Nakia, the distant land, and care of flocks and cattle for their father. Now give the, those kind a wild, a wide berth. Keep your thoughts intent upon your course for home. And hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Rough years then lie between you and your homecoming, alone and old. The one survivor, all your companions lost. Ugh. All right, so Odysseus is like, ah, uh, how am I going to do this? And, um... And Cersei is like, oh, basically, you just like you just avoid them, and maybe like if you don't avoid them, then everyone will die. So you better avoid them. 
Just don't try to fight them because they are immortal. That's <laughs> you can't kill immortal things. That's a fun fact. And Cersei spoke. Dawn mounted her golden throne, and on the first rays, Cersei left me, taking her way like a great goddess up on the island. I made straight for the ship, roused the men up to get aboard, and cast off at the stern. They scrambled to their places by the rowlocks, and all in line dipped oars in the gray sea. But soon offshore, a breeze blew to our liking, a canvas belling breeze, a lusty shipmate sent by the singing nip with bright, sun bright hair. So we made fast the braces, and we rested, letting the wind and steersmen work the ship. The crew being now silent for me, I addressed them, sore at heart. Dear friends, more than one man or two should know these things Cersei foresaw for us and shared with me. So let me tell her forecast. Then we die with our eyes open, if we are going to die. Or know what death we baffled if we can. Sirens, leaving a haunting song over the sea. We are to shun. She said, and their green shore, all sweet with clover. Yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore, you are to tie me up, tight as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast. And if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muffle me. I rather dwelt on this part of the forecast, while our good ship made time, bound to outward toward the do outward down the wind for the strange island of sirens. Then, all at once, the wind fell, a calm came over all the sea, as though some power lulled the swell. The crew were on their feet, briskly, to furl the sail and stow it then. Each place, each in place, they poised the small oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. No long task, for burning heat came down from Helios, lord of high noon. Going forward, I carried wax along the line and laid it thick on their ears. They tied me up, then plumb amidships, back to the mast, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to rowing. Soon, as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens, noting our fast ship off their point, made ready, and they sang. So basically... Odysseus just recap to his men what Cersei said to do the ritual where they tie him to the mast and they like keep tying him if he cries out and he's going to listen to the song that will foretell the future and then they're going to have to go through Skyla and they're going to have to go through those two people and they're just going to have to like power through and avoid them or else everyone's going to die. <laughs> And then the sirens sang, This way, O oh, turn your bows, Achaia's glory, as all the world allows, more and, and be merry. Sweet coupled airs we sing, no lonely seafire holds clear of entering our green mirror. Pleased by each purling note, like bony twining from her throat and my throat. Who lies a pining? Sea rovers here take joy, voyaging onward as from our song of Troy. Greybeard and rower boy, goth more learned. All feats on that great field in the long way warfare. Dark days the bright gods willed, wounds you bore there. Sorry, wounds you bore there. Argos is old soldiery on Troy beach teeming. Charmed out of time we see. No life on earth can be hid from our dreaming. The lovely voices and ardor. Sorry, I have to sing that. Let me go through it again. This way. Oh, turn your bows. Uh, bows. Okay, this glory. As all the world allows. More and be merry. Okay, you get the idea. The lovely voices and ardor appealing over the water made me crave to listen, and I tried to say, Untie me! to the crew, jerking my brows. But they spent steady to the oars. Then Paramedes got to his feet, he and Eurylokos, and passed more line about to hold me still. So all rode on until the sirens dropped under the sea rim, and their singing dwindled away. My faithful company rested on their oars now peeling off the wax that I had laid thick on their ears, then set me free. But scarcely had that island faded in blue air, then I saw smoke in white water, with sounds of waves and tumult. A sound the men heard, and it terrified them, 
Oars flew from their hands. The blades went knocking a wild along till the side ship lost way, with no oar blades to drive her through the water. Well, I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing over every oarsman, saying gently, Friends, have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome it is now than when the Cyclopses penned us in the cave. What power he had! Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? Now I say, by hook or crook, this peril too shall be something that we remember. Heads up, lads! We must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands and lay back hard on your benches. Hit these breaking seas. Zeus, help us pull away before we founder. You, at the tiller, listen, and take in all that I have to say. The rudders are your duty. Keep her out of the combers in the smoke. Steer for that headland. Watch the drift, or we fetch upon the smoother, the smother, small, smother, smile, smooth, 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 smother. Smother. Oh my god, I'm stupid. I'm freaking stupid. I didn't recognize smother. <laughs> 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 All right. Fetch up in the smother, and you drown us. That was all, and it brought them round to action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing, as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their oars again in panic to roll for cover under the decking. Circe's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied my cuirass and took up two heavy spears, then made my way along to the foredeck, thinking to see her first from there, the monster of the gray rock, harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. And all this time, in travail, travail sobbing, graining, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait, Skyla to port, and on her star, starboard, team carbid, Carbidus, um, or Charbidus, dire gorge of the salt sea tide. By heaven, when she vomited, all the sea was like cauldron, seething over intense fire, when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. The spot spume soared to all the landslide heights and fell like rain. But when she swallowed the sea water down, we saw the funnel of the maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. My men all blanched again. Blanched. I know that's not at all how you pronounce it. Blanched. Blanched. I said it right. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, pfft. Blanched against the gloom, our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. Then Skyla made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. I happened to glance at, at ship and oarsmen, and caught sight of their arms and legs, dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. A man surf, surf, surf casted on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and the bait far out, will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling through the air. So these were borne aloft and spasm toward the cliff. She ate them as they shrieked there in her den, in the dire grapple, reaching still for me, and deathly pity ran me through at that sight, far the worst I have ever suffered, questing the passes of the strange sea, we rode on. The rocks were now behind us. Carbidus, too. Charbidus, too. And Skyla dropped astern. So this was basically Skyla killed just eight, six of his men. She kept eating men. And like they tried a couple methods. Like they, I think they used fish. And they used fish to like uh, disorient Skyla. But like really, they had only like a, a bunch of Odysseus men uh, died as they were going through. And then he also got the prophet from um, the two sirens, and so that's what the that's what happened. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Um. Then we were coasting the noble island of the god, where grazed those cattle with wide brows and bontius flocks of Helios, lord of noon, who rides high heaven, 
From the black ship, far still at sea, I heard the lowing of the cow... Lowing? Probably right. Lowing of the cattle, winding home... Oh my god. Winding home, and she bleeding. And heard, too, in my heart, the words of blind Tiresias, of Thebes, and Circe of Aia. Both forbade me, the island of the world's delight, the sun. So I spoke out in gloom to my companions. Shipmates, grieving and weary though you are, listen, I had forewarning from Tiresias, and Circe too, both told me I must shun this island of the sun, the world's delight, nothing but fatal trouble shall we find here, pull away then, and put the land astern. So basically, they reach the land of Helios, and they're like, ah, oh, screw you, Helios, I don't like you very much at all, and so they pass it by. Um, are you flesh and blood, Odysseus, to endure more than a man can? Do you ever tire? God, look at you. Iron is what you're made of. Here we all are, half dead with weariness, falling asleep over the oars. Oh, oof. over the oars. And you're saying no landing, no firm island earth where we can make a quiet supper. No, pull out to sea, you say, with night upon us. Just as before, but wandering now and lost. Sudden storms can rise at night and swap ships without a trace. Where is your shelter if some stiff gale blows up from south or west? The winds that break up shipping every time when seamen flout the Lord God's will. I say do as the hour demands and go ashore before black night comes down. We'll make our supper alongside and at dawn put out to sea. So basically, one of Odysseus's men is like, eh, no, it's a bad idea to just keep going. I think we should stop. Now, of course, Odysseus wants them to keep going because Circe and uh, Tiresias both said that they should pass it by. Like, don't, don't go in there. Don't go to the, the sun. To the sun land. The island of the sun. <laughs> now, when the rest said I to this, I saw the power of destiny devastating ill. Oh, sorry. I saw the power of destiny devising ill. Sharply, I answered, without hesitation. Yuri Locos, they are with you to a man. I am alone, outmatched. Let this whole company swear me a great oath, and herd of cattle or flock of sheep here found shall go unharmed. No one shall slaughter out of wantonness, ram or heifer. I shall be content with what the goddess Circe put aboard. They fell at once to swearing as I ordered, and when the rounds of oaths had ceased, we found a half-moon bay to beach the, and moor the ship in. With a fresh spring nearby, all hands ashore, went about skillfully getting up a meal. Then, after thirst and hunger, those besiegers were turned away. They mourned for their companions, plucked from the ship by Skyla, and devoured. And sleep came soft upon them as they mourned. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first duck of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven, and clouds driven by Zeus shrouded land and sea in the night of storm. So, just as dawn with her fingertips of rose touched the windy wor the windy world, the wind windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave where nymphs had chairs of rock and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, so basically they just go in, they sleep, and then once it's morning again, they go into this cave with a bunch of nymphs in it. I mustered all the crew and said, old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold, food and drink. The cattle here are not for our provision, or we pay dearly for it. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep. Helios, and no man avoids his eye. So basically, he says, don't kill his cattle. Like, this is a god's place. Like, do not, like, eat his cattle. Like, he will be very mad. And that's what he said before. He put them all under oath that they would not eat the cattle. Ugh. All right. How much longer? Hey, only, like, five more pages. All right. Whew. All right. To this, my fighters nodded. Yes, but now we had a month of onshore gales, blowing day in, day out, south winds or south by east, as long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up and appease their craving. 
They would not touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, hunger drove them to scour the wild shore, whatever fell into their hands, and lean days wore their bellies thin. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympos. All the gods, but they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now on the shore of Eurylokos made in... Oh, sorry, I should stop there. Um... Basically, Odysseus goes out, prays to the gods, like, oh, God, just stop these gosh darn storms. So he's, like, praying to the gods, and he's like, I don't want these storms. These storms, no, mm, mm, mm. And, but they just, the gods were like, yeah, screw you, Odysseus, and they just put him to sleep. All right. So I think they took refuge in the cave. Oh, no, that's where they put their ship. They put their ship in the cave. So that's not where they um, slept. They slept in the ship, in the cave. <laughs> now on the shore, Eurylokos made his insidious plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us. Mortal wretches, but famine is the most pitiful, the worst that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home, the, in the old country of Ithaca, if that day ever comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. But if he flares up over his hyphers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods may cause with him, why, then I say, better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste to skin and bones on a lonely island. Thus Yuri Locos, and they murmured, I, trooping away, at once to round up their hyphers. Now, that day tranquil cattle with broad bows, bros, broughton, come on. Now, that day tranquil cat cattle with broad brows were grazing near. And soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak, having no barley meal, to strew the victims, performed the prayers and ritual. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> knife the kind and flayed each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings, with strips of meat, were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first. And when the bones were burnt and stripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. Just then, my slumber left me in a rush. My eyes opened, and I went down the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of her black hull than savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me. Grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, Oh, Father Zeus, and gods in bliss forever, you made me sleep away this day of mischief. Oh, cruel drowsing in the evil hour. Here they sat, and the great work they contrived. So basically, uh, the men, while Odysseus was asleep, um, they, they killed Helios's cattle. Uh, even though, you know, Odysseus said, don't do that. He specifically said not to do that. And no, Odysseus is sad that they did that. <laughs> but fair enough, they were starving. You know, they had, they had to have something to eat, and they couldn't just starve. And so Lampedia, in her long gown, meanwhile, had borne swift word to the overlord of Noom. They have killed your kind. And the lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the more immortals. Oh, Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus's men. So overweening, now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climbed the sky of stars, and evening when I bore westward from heaven. Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus, who drives the storm cloud, may reply, Peace, Helios, shine on among the gods. Shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white, holt, white, one white hot bolt and make splinters of their ships in the wine-dark sea. Calypso later told me of this exchange, as she declared that Hermes had told her. 
Well, when I reached the sea cave in the ship, I faced each man and had it out. But where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear. Cow hides began to crawl, and beef, both raw and roasted, lowed like kine upon the spits. So basically, as uh, Calypso told Odysseus, um, the the gods were pretty pretty angry about it, and then they they got rid of all the meat they got. Like the meat is now spoiled; it's gone. You know, it's like ugh, oof, oof, ouch. That is a lot of spoiled meat. And actually, they didn't even just, like, make it spoiled. They made it into, like, cows again. So out of the raw beef, they made cows out of the raw beef. I think that's what this is saying. Like, the, the beef was walking. Now, six full days, my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios's herd. And Zeus, the son of Kronos, added one fine morning. Uh, and all the gales had ceased, blown out with an offshore breeze. We launched again, stepping the mast and sail. Sorry, wait, let me check something. Uh, Okay, so I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, all the gales had ceased, blown out, and with an offshore breeze, we launched again, stepping the mast and sail to make for the open sea. Astern of us, the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere, but only sea and heaven. With Zeus Cronion piled a thunderhead above the ship, while gloom spread on the ocean. We held our course, but briefly. Then the squall struck whining from the west. With, a, with gale force, breaking both four stays, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length. So the running rigging showered into the bilge. On the after deck, the mast had hit the steersman, a slant blow bashing the skull in, knocking him overside as the brave soul fled the body like a diver. With crack on crack of thunder, Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she bucked in reeking fumes of sulfur and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the deck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. No more seafaring homeward for these. No sweet days of return. The god had turned his face from them. I clamored for and aft my hulk into a comber. Split her, keel from ribs, and big in the big timber floated free. The mast, too, broke away. A backstay floated dangling from it, stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing, mast and keel together. This I straddled, riding the frightful storm. So after a while, they get on the ship, they're, you know, getting ready to sail, and then Zeus, you know, kills the ship. Uh, you know, the ship's destroyed, some guy dies, and like, you know, not good. Nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the, rest, the west wind dropped, and a southeast gale came on. One more twist of the knife, taking me north again. And in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay of Skyla Mountain in Cherubdis Deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on like a bat under a boff. Boff? Bo? 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 Bow. Bow. A main branch of a tree. Bow. Hmm. <clears throat> Under a bough, nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing, the root of and bowl being far below, and far above my head the branches and their leaves, mast overshadowing Charbadis's pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted. And ha, how long, with what desire, I waited, till at twilight hour, when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace, all day between contentious men, goes home to supper. The long poles at last reared from the sea. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride, and rode hard with my hands to pass by Scylla. Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men, this time, kept me from her eyes. 
Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea, before I made shore, bu buoyed up by the gods, upon Ogygia Isle. The dangerous nymph Calypso lives and sings there, in her beauty, and she received me, loved me, the same tale that I told last night in hall to you and your lady. Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. Oh my god! Oh. Summary. So Odysseus tells the tale to Alcinous and whoever that him and his men they they went back to Circe's island to give a funeral for one of their men who like fell down from a ladder after being drunk. So they give him a funeral, and Circe basically tells Odysseus, and and she basically tells him, um, yeah, basically, um, listen to the future tellings of si of the sirens and basically have your men tie you up to a mast, make them cover their ears so they can't hear the fortune telling, and then have them tie you up even further if you want out, just so that you can hear the entire song, all right? And then you'll pass by Scylla and whatever that person is, and you're just going to have to power through them. Don't try to fight them. Just, like, maybe try to distract them a little bit, but, like, just... Power through, power through, and then you'll reach the land of the sun, of the island of the sun, which is owned by Helios. And whatever you do, do not stop at that island. And even if you do stop at that island, don't kill the cattle. And so they do all of that. And then once they reach the island of the sun, they stop there and eat the cattle because they were starving and they were tired. And so then Zeus was like, "Ah, oh, that's bad." And so he like. He put a curse on their meat, and then he, when they were out shipping, like he like almost killed them. And Odysseus, he like latched onto a tree for help, but then he like let go because he couldn't hold out any longer. Drifted for nine days till he reached Ogygia and and Circe and uh, Calypso, and that's where we left off, and that's where we know definitively. Oh, God, that was something.